In the words of famed recording artist 2 Unlimited, you're ready for this? So today, I'm doing something that I've really, really wanted to do for quite some time now, and that is the season review for the Geelong Cats. Will this be fair and balanced? Because I am a Crow supporter, and I'm apparently still mad about the Dangerfield trade? No, this is going to be a, a look at the season that was, and the trends that have appeared in the past couple seasons across the Cats. So, without further ado, we'll get into the review, and I can guarantee you at least one thing. It's going to be more entertaining than the grand final. Like I said, with some of the things that I will say today, people might think I'm just a Salty Crows fan about the Dangerfield trade. Uh, no. If anything, I think the Crows played better when he was gone. Although, it would have helped us in that grand final that we don't speak about. 2019 season for the Geelong Cats have been pretty uneven. Even winning the minor premiership, they didn't look super convincing going into finals. In fact, a lot of us saw them either making a semi and then getting knocked getting knocked down straight set. However, they managed to make a prelim and then kind of blow it against the Tigers. The start of the year for the Cats was ridiculous. By the time they entered the bye, they were sitting at 11 and 1. And along with that going well for them, Tim Kelly looked like an absolute superstar and a pretty solid chance to win the Brownlow medal. Tom Hawkins was contributing with a fair few goals, not as much as his prime, but still being a very good hand up front. Dangerfield, Gablet, and Selwood were all being absolute studs in the midfield, as they should be. And the defense was rock solid. Pretty much the best defense in the league shutting down high-scoring opponents and just keeping everyone on ta under tabs. And even with their, their aging stars, they had Youth Sharp with Jordan Clark, Charlie Constable, and Garen Myers winning nominations for the Rising Star in their res in respective rounds and looking to be the guys who take over from the big three. The defense was the best in the league, even after some post-buy slump, which we'll get to. Um, they still were very solid, kept them in a lot of games where it looked like they shouldn't be in it, and realistically have probably one of the more underrated defensive cores at the moment, especially with Mark Blitzarves, Harry Taylor, and the old guard kind of just holding down the fort, even with the loss of a lot of their players in couple the past couple of years. Going into the bye, sitting at 11-1, they were pretty much white hot favorites to be uh the uh to win the premiership exceeding my expectations of thinking that time will take them down but they just kept going they were absolutely white hot going into their bye and then as has been seen in the past couple of years there is a definite drop off post bye for the cats first a stunning loss to the Power, who are also pretty woeful away from home at the Adelaide Oval. But then they managed to peg that back against the Crows. And like with many teams we've seen this season, they've yo-yoed up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down to finish out the season with a 5-5 five and five record, playing some pretty bad football at some points, but also then sometimes playing good enough football to play finals, but the sheer inconsistency played in the last 10 rounds made them look like an easy out, even if they won the minor premiership. Even with this yo-yoing form, where at some points it looked like they didn't even want to make finals, like pretty much every other team from six downwards, uh, unfortunately their early season efforts put them in the finals, even despite some terrible performances. But that being said, finals still had to be played, and their first matchup came against the Pies, 
who, despite being decimated by injuries, looked to be getting hot at the right time. So, how did that go for them? Well, for the most part, they were kind of shut out by uh, Collingwood's defense, and their offense really couldn't get much going. While the defense still put up a hell of a fight, they were pretty much dominated for the most part, but still managed to keep it relatively close. The defense did such a good job, in fact, they shut out the Pies in the final quarter, but unfortunately, their, their forward line could not match the production and only scored two goals in response, leaving them to fall short by only 10 points. Next, they came up against the Eagles, who, even though they smoked the Bombers, should should have been a really, really good game. And pretty much for two quarters each side, they were playing really well. First quarter for the Cat, kind of dominated. The next two quarters, it looked like Eagles were going to run over the top and run away with it. And then the final quarter, they totally shut. The Cats totally shut the Eagles out, managing to kick away and win by 20 points. And then Tom Hawkins decides to be a petulant idiot and strike Will Schofield behind the ball, getting him suspended for the prelim. Now, going into a preliminary final, uh, you really want your best weapon up forward to be there. And... Tom Hawkins pretty much shooting himself in the foot, really put Geelong on a back foot. As going into this final, you could argue that he would have been a great asset against a Richmond defense that probably can't deal with two bigger forwards. That being said, a game still had to be played. And that being said, the Cats didn't lie down against a Richmond team that had not lost a game for 10 games straight. They came out firing. They were looking really, really good going to halftime. And then it just kind of petered away. Richmond ran over the top of them and won by 20 points. Killing a very, very promising season. Arguably, they probably should have at least made the grand final. But that's just how the cookie crumbles. And honestly, I wouldn't say the Tom Hawkins suspension. I would say it did cost them. But I think one big factor costs them probably even more. And I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, like, this is just a serious question for Cats fans. Are you satisfied with all these finals, making all these finals, and not making a grand final since 2011? Now, I this more falls on coaching for me. Um... I think that Chris Scott, even though he won that premiership in 2011, that that was pretty much Bomber Thompson's team. He hasn't really done anything else outside of winning that one premiership. So I don't think it really has anything to do with the players. I think it just has to do with the coaching. Like I said, we're reaching pretty much Tampa Bay Lightning levels of wasted talent. You have, I'm going to say, three, four players that are bordering on generational talent, a bunch of superstars around them. Hell, you even lose one or two of them and you pull another one out of your ass, but it's still not enough to get you to at least the grand final. It's pretty startling and really sad when you think about it. Again, Cats probably should have another couple premierships under their belt and with the Holy Trinity in the midfield, they should have at least made the grand final once. Now, like I said, Chris Scott, I feel, outside of that one premiership, hasn't really done anything for the Cats. They've always been super talented. In fact, they made four prelims, two semis, two elimination finals, and they only missed one finals in 2015. But with that being said, with all those final runs, they haven't made the big dance, even once. And you think about all the players that have gone through in that time since 2011, you think they should have at least made it. Now, even though the Hawks juggernaut kind of cock-blocked everyone, I still think they probably should have made at least one 
and especially this year with the way that they played early on and then they completely floundered. Honestly, it feels like Chris Scott just coasting off the three, probably the three greatest midfielders of a generation. Doesn't really think about a way to outplay them. They just kind of rely on high-end talent to bail them, bail them out. And bringing up another sports metaphor, he kind of reminds me of a Mike McCarthy, kind of like Mike McCarthy, who, if you don't know, was a former coach for the Green Bay Packers who essentially just relied on uh, his star quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, to bail him out of his complete lack of game management or anything. But yeah, having three of the greatest midfielders of a generation and still not making a grand final is pretty atrocious. And even though the sands of time are running out on the Cats' uh, window... I still think they can make a grand final, but I don't think it's with Chris Scott. He needs to go. Again, some Cats fans might be like, well, we made a prelim, but with all that talent, is that really enough? I mean, arguably, your team has more talent than the Crows, even in 2017. They had more talent than the Crows, but we made a grand final. As much as it went poorly... We made it. And you just got to ask yourself, all this spinning of the hamster wheel is, and just making deep final run, is that enough for you? Because I would say with the talent on your list, no. Even if Tim Kelly leaves, you got, like I said, Constable and all those guys. But I just don't think it's going to get done under Chris Scott. And and when uh, Selwood and Ablett retire... Dangerfield would still be pretty good, but I don't think, I I don't know how they're going to respond to that. If you want one glistening example of why I think Chris Scott is the main problem of the Cats, it's probably in the game against Brisbane where Charlie Cameron kicks five goals out of about 11 or 12. Now, Usually you go, yeah, that player had a bit of an impact. Chris Scott steadfastly said, nope, didn't have an impact on the game whatsoever. Now, I'm not saying that's grounds to get fired, but it's pretty bloody close, especially since they only lost by a goal. Now, with that being said, do I think... Um, Geelong's window, premiership window is completely closed. No, like I said, I think it's still open, but I don't think they'll win under Chris Scott. So they need to get another proactive coach to coach them to success. But yeah, this season's really hard for me to judge for cat for the cats because on one hand, all the potential they had, the white hot start, eleven and one to slump to 16 and 6, still enough to win a minor premiership. But again, people just kind of saw them as getting swept out of the building in two games straight. Now, again, the home and away accolades and stuff like that is all good, but you kind of want more. With the talent you've got, I feel it's not wrong to want more from that list and that coaching staff. So I'm just going to give them a 5 out of 10. Great potential. For as many ups as they were, there were a bunch of downs. And I feel like you could have said that about like 12 of the teams this year. And I'll give you my thoughts on the rest of the teams later. Anyway, did you think this was as interesting as the grand final? If so, let me know in the comments below and give this video a big thumbs up. And subscribe to AFL Access to stay notified of all new content by ringing that little bell next to the subscribe button. Only got a couple more left. Three reviews to go. Next, next I'll be doing the Collingwood Magpies. And after that, I'm going to be getting into the real meat of the season. That's right, the off-season. This has been your AFL Access.